This is Tokens. I'm Lee C. Camp. If you're a pro-life person, the only way you're going to win that battle is by convincing people to take a pro-life stance. And that is much more than electing a certain president and getting certain justices on the Supreme Court. It's more a matter of winning hearts and minds. And the approach has to be one not of power, but of love. That's Bill Cavanaugh, professor of Catholic studies at DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois, recently the author of a provocative article about the abortion debates in America. And no spoilers here, except to say he taught me some quite surprising facts about political and social realities around abortion, which I did not know, and I suspect most people do not know. And for the sake of open and honest acknowledgement, yes, this episode is two men talking about abortion, which can be problematic. But you can trust we don't presume it's the last word on the topic. Instead, it's me asking one scholar about an article of his I find really important, which points to some of the problematic politicizing of abortion. We will also discuss Bill's book, Torture and Eucharist and Being Consumed, In the midst of all that, we'll hear the ways in which Christians may be called to be, in Bill's words, politically homeless. And if all of that were not enough, we'll hear this also from Bill. It's one of the great Christian idolatries, I think, is nationalism. All this coming right up. Bill Cavanaugh, professor of Catholic studies and director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at uh, DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois, author of numerous books and articles, especially around political theology and economic ethics. Bill, it's great to see you. Good to see you, Lee. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, welcome. Glad to get to talk to you again. You're in the midst of snowstorm in Chicago. Nice (laughs) picturesque-looking flakes coming down right now. It's good to be indoors. I do miss those uh, days of getting lots and lots of snow from my South Bend, Indiana days. It builds character, as Garrison Keillor likes to say. It does. It does, indeed. That's right, because you spent some years in Minnesota as well, right? Yeah, 15 years. Yeah. Are the are the Minnesota winters harder than Chicago winters? Yeah, as a rule. Yeah. <laughs> Global warming has made everything a little bit uh, gentler these days, yeah. but... When we first moved up there, it was pretty severe. I remember talking to a guy as I was moving into my office, and I asked him if it was still pretty warm outside, and he said, yeah, it's about 82 above. And I thought, oh, God. (laughs) Did he just say 82 above? As if, you know, you have to specify when you say 82. So Uh, Yeah, I do. Certainly, living in South Bend was my first time living out of the South ever. I remember certainly having to learn how to buy coats and clothes that could survive those sorts of winters. But I have very fond memories of, in those days, I would either ride a bike or ride the bus to across town to go to school and I remember very early in the morning before the sun was up, you know, trudging from our house to the bus stop in six inches of fresh snow. And, you know, in my sentimental ways, they're very fond memories of the cold and the the quiet. (laughs) That's because you knew that someday you'd be moving back down south. (laughs) Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) Well, I'm fascinated with your recent article, Electing Republicans Has Not Reversed Roe v. Wade. It's time to change our strategy. And I have probably stuck that on numerous, numerous conversations on Facebook just because I saw you raising issues there of which I have heard very little discussion. But you first talk about your experience as a pro-life college Republican. This was something that you, you've been concerned with for a while as far as Roe v. Wade and abortion and so forth. Right. Yeah. When I was a freshman at Notre Dame in 1980, I, uh, I joined two organizations, the Right to Life and the College Republicans. And I assumed that the two kind of went hand in hand. All we needed to do was elect Republicans and Roe versus Wade would be overturned and we'd go back to the, the good old days. And so then in time, you came to realize later that there appears to be some hypocrisy or at least a a failure to keep some promises around the issue? Well, I think that's right. If you look at what's actually happened, you know, another 40 years have passed since 1980, and Republicans have had control of the Supreme Court for the whole time. 
in fact, 50 of the last 51 years, there's been a Republican majority on the Supreme Court. Uh, the only exception being the year after Antonin Scalia died when there was a tie, and nothing's changed. You know, we, we keep hearing all we have to do is elect Republican presidents and they will name justices to the Supreme Court that will overturn Roe versus Wade, and it just keeps not happening. It, it keeps being Lucy holding the football for Charlie Brown. I was quite surprised, if I remember correctly from your article, you indicated something like that when the Roe v. Wade decision was passed, it was a 7-2 to two vote. And at that time, there were seven Republican appointees on the Supreme Court. Six. Six, okay. And then, and then one of the dissenting votes, I think you said, was actually a Democrat appointee. That's right. There were only two votes against Roe v. Wade. One was Rehnquist, the Republican appointee who was chief justice, and the other was Byron White, who was a Democratic appointee. So five of the six Republican justices voted for Roe versus Wade. I've been quite interested, and this is going a bit astray from your article, but Randall Balmer has argued for some years now, especially like in his book, God in the White House, that it was in the late 70s leading up to the campaign for Ronald Reagan that Republicans actually didn't care much about abortion and then at that point, they began to kind of fish around for an issue by which they thought they could capture American evangelical vote. And uh, they strategized and figured out maybe they could get the vote this way, which, which at that level seems to have been successful. Any kind of commentary on that from your perspective as a Catholic theologian? Yeah, in some ways, it's a kind of extension of Nixon's Southern strategy. You appeal to people in the South uh, on the basis of cultural issues even if the economic issues are against their own interests. You speculate some about perhaps why the failure to overturn Roe v. Wade has occurred. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a number of possible reasons. One is that the Republicans haven't really wanted to overturn uh, Roe v. Wade. If you look at the record of the Republicans during a Republican administrations, they've been remarkably successful in all sorts of ways, you know, lowering taxes, uh, especially taxes on the wealthy, and cutting taxes for corporations, increasing military spending, cutting food stamps, other safety net programs, you know, making sure that there is easy access to assault weapons, promoting the death penalty, torture during the post 9-11 period, preferring nationalism over refugees and immigrants, gutting environmental protection laws, greenlighting the Contras, the list just goes on and on. It's a, it's a bit of an overwhelming list. <laughs> it, it is. It really is. All of which, you know, and, and all of these things, none of them seem very gospel uh, oriented to me. And, but the one thing, their main selling point to Christians has been this position on abortion, and they've been strangely ineffective in doing what they say they're going to do, which is overturning uh, Roe versus Wade. And so you have to ask why this is the case. And, and it seems like they get done what they really want to get done, what are really priorities. And this is, is, is not a priority. So that's one possibility. And another possibility is, is that it doesn't really matter who is nominated for the Supreme Court that at this point, the, the principle of stare decisis means that it's not going to be uh, overturned. Stare decisis is a Latin phrase that means to stand by that which is decided. So it is, in my layman's understanding, a legal doctrine by which a court is bound to follow historical precedent. Chief Justice John Roberts, pro-life Catholic, appointed by a Republican administration, he invoked that principle last year in the case of knocking down abortion restrictions in Louisiana on the basis of stare decisis. And so it, it's possible that it won't be overturned no matter who gets elected to the presidency and who gets nominated to the Supreme Court. So from your perspective, in your article, you, the subtitle is, It's Time to Change Our Strategy. What sorts of other possible strategies do you see for those who kind of want to be more thoughtful about how they might think about being a, embodying a pro-life witness, what might that look like? 
Yeah, well, I think the first thing that needs to be realized is that even if the strategy were to work, it's possible that the current uh, Supreme Court with a six to three Republican majority, it's possible that they will overturn uh, Roe versus Wade. But it's not going to make that much difference. It, it'll go back to the situation before Roe versus Wade in 1973. And that was not a situation in which abortion was outlawed. That was a situation in which it was legal in some states and not legal in other states. So actually, the rate of legal abortions in the United States in 1972, before Roe versus Wade, is actually higher than it is now, right? And so people don't realize, they think that abortion went from being illegal to being legal in 1973, and that's not the case. In the 1930s, there were over 800,000 abortions a year in the United States, legal abortions. And so all that would happen if Roe versus Wade were struck down was that it would just return to the states and become a state-by-state issue. And so if you wanted an abortion and you lived in a state where it was illegal, you'd go to a state where it was legal. And so it it then would become a kind of, you know, hand-to-hand combat on on the state level. And so if you're a pro-life person, the only way you're going to win that battle is by convincing people to take a pro-life stance. And that is much more than electing a certain president and getting certain justices on the Supreme Court. It's more a matter of winning hearts and minds. And the approach has to be one not of power, but of love, I think. The only way you're going to convince people of the sanctity of life is by actually taking care of women who find themselves in crisis pregnancies. I just want to make sure I heard what you said a moment ago. So you're saying that in 1972, prior to Roe v. Wade, the abortion rate was higher than it is today? Yes, that's right. There were uh, over 600,000 legal abortions in uh, 1972. And on a per capita basis, that's actually higher than the rate has been now for several years. The, the rate has been dropping under both Democratic and Republican administrations now for the last couple of decades and continues to decline. I've seen some folks argue, and then I've seen other people who have discredited these arguments, that the rate actually dropped more under Democrat presidents. Is that your sense that that's correct or no? Yeah, there's kind of dueling statistics on this. And it seems to be the case that it dropped the fastest under Obama, but it's dropped under both Republican and Democratic administrations for the last like 25 years or or so. And it, it, it doesn't seem to be a real significant difference in the rate of drop under both kinds of administrations. What are further specifics on things that you would like to see happen to win minds and hearts, as you described a moment ago? Well, one of the things I think that needs to happen is we need to stop shooting ourselves in the foot. I mean, so you've got two narratives out there. One is that restricting abortion is promoting human life. And the other is that restricting abortion is oppressing women. And so there are these two um, competing narratives out there. So how do you convince people that it is, in fact, a matter of protecting life and it's not a matter of restricting women's freedom? Um, Well, you have to actually be pro-life then. You have to be consistently on the side of human life. And that means all of those things that I had named before, torture and war and the death penalty and, you know, cutting support for poor people and so on, that all of those things are life issues. And you have to be consistently on the side of life in order to not be accused justifiably of hypocrisy, right? In order to convince people that in fact, it really is about life and not about the domination of men over women. The way to lose that argument is to elect a president, to go all in on a president who has bragged about sexually assaulting women, 
right? Hitching the pro-life wagon to Donald Trump might be one of the most damaging things that's ever happened to the pro-life movement. This is not going to convince anybody that this is really about the sanctity of human life, about which our former president didn't seem to care much. So one of the things that can happen, I think, is that people can try to be consistent. But of course, being consistent on these matters means not being an adherent of either one of the parties, right? I mean, both of the parties kind of fall short on some of these issues of life. And so in some ways, if you're a Christian, you you need to be kind of politically homeless, but definitely not just kind of go all in on what we've seen for for the last four years. I think that's just been a disaster for the pro-life movement. So those are some of the things that I think pro-life people should avoid. What they can do positively are the kinds of care for women who find themselves in pregnancies and feel alone. A lot of what we can do is not just advocate for restrictions on, on what women's options are, but give them more options, promote adoption, care for, for women in crisis pregnancies. And this is the kind of thing that can and should happen at the micro level. You know, individual churches, instead of getting all fired up about presidential elections you know, that don't really seem to have any effect on this issue over the long run or in the short run, that local churches and local communities can actually band together and start supporting women that find themselves in difficult crisis pregnancy situations and actually support them and give them options that make them feel like they can carry a baby to term and receive some support. I've been talking to Professor Bill Cavanaugh, Professor of Catholic Studies, Director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at DePaul University in Chicago. We'll be right back with the discussion of another one of Bill's writings entitled Torture and Eucharist. Be right back. You're listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, and the Good Life. We're most grateful to have you joining us. We do enjoy, well, usually (laughs) we enjoy hearing from you. I was a little put out, I must say, to have one listener suggest I was a fascist after listening to our episode on fake news. Nonetheless, if you've got feedback or thoughts, send it our way. If you'll send us voice memos, we might just air what you have to say. Send email or attach a voice memo and email podcast at tokensshow.com. Plus, if you like this podcast, then give us a little love back in one of two ways. One, refer us to a fellow podcast listener. Or two, go to Apple Podcasts and write us one of those glowing five-star reviews. All that helps us continue to grow and expand our reach. This is our interview with Bill Cavanaugh, Professor of Catholic Studies at DePaul University. Coming up, we discuss Bill's work, Torture and Eucharist, about the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile and the role of the Catholic Church in that setting, and Bill and my own experience in Santiago, Chile, related to the book. If you don't know of this book, and or if you do not know some of the basic history of Chile in the 1970s and 80s, you will not want to miss part two coming up in just a moment. Welcome back to Tokens and our interview with Professor Bill Cavanaugh. Bill, some years ago, I guess it was 2014, you zoomed into a class I was teaching in Santiago, Chile, about your troubling and humbling book entitled Torture and Eucharist, Theology, Politics, and the Body of Christ. I knew before going and teaching in Santiago a bit about the story of Chile, but for those who are unaware of what happened in the early late 1960s, early 1970s, why don't you just give quickly a brief historical overview of some of the key developments there? In many ways, Chile was one of the most stable democracies in Latin America in the period before the 1960s, 1970s. But large-scale inequality uh, was always a problem, as it is in much of Latin America, right from the conquest. And so people were agitating for land reform, distributing the land, much of which was appropriated during the conquest and so on, more equitable societal and economic relationships. And so there was a very active left socialist and communist parties in Chile. 
1970, they succeeded in electing Salvador Allende, who was a socialist, and set about instituting land reform and nationalization of certain industries and so on. And this was very unpopular amongst the upper classes in Chile. Ultimately, the middle classes as well, the United States, um, played a part in trying to destabilize Allende's regime. And in the end, on September 11th of 1973, the military lit a coup and took over. And everybody thought that this would be a kind of transitional period and they'd get back to democracy. But General Pinochet kind of took power and didn't relinquish it, established a regime of torture and disappearances and terrorized the population and stayed in power for another 17 years. And so I I worked in a poor area of Santiago for the last couple of years of the Pinochet regime. And by that time, the church had become a thorn in his side. The church had kind of taken on the role of the only sort of institutional bulwark against the military regime, because in a lot of ways, the church was sort of untouchable, the one organization that Pinochet couldn't shut down. And so the ideology of the military regime took a lot from Milton Friedman and neoliberalism. Milton Friedman was an invited guest of General Pinochet a couple of times uh, after he uh, took power. And the economists that were supposed to reorganize society were known as Los Chicago Boys, all of whom had been trained by Friedman at the University of Chicago. And the idea was to kind of individualize a society. You get rid of unions, you get rid of political parties, you put restrictions on any way that people can gather, and you envision society as a group of individual entrepreneurs. And so that then becomes the, the strategy and torture then becomes part of that strategy. When you torture people, they stay away from other people. Fear and anxiety spread throughout society, and people spend, as one person said, I spent years swearing at the television set. You do away with all of the torture as an attack more on social bodies than it is just on uh, individual bodies in this way. When I was teaching there that one semester, we had the privilege of spending a day with a gentleman uh, who toured us. I'm drawing a blank on it. Is it Via Grimaldi? Right, that yeah. You, that you discussed in the first chapter of your book. And we showed up at Via Grimaldi, which was prior to the Pinochet regime, apparently this beautiful Italian villa right at the base of the Andes Mountains, and just a gorgeous space, gorgeous setting and was used as a, one of the chief torture centers for the regime. And he took us through telling us how people were received there, how they were brought in, and slowly began to take us from one place to another in the remains of the villa, describing the horror and the grotesque way, especially in the early years, where it sounds like there was, there was, no, there was no real purpose to it at all other than just this infliction of fear and horror. And as we had been with him for probably an hour and a half or two hours, he then said, and this is where they took me. And he then began to open up about his own experience, that he was simply, as I recollect, the president of his law school class. And simply because he had the power, you know, I'll put that in scare quotes, the power as the president of his law school class, he was targeted. And even then, you know, decades later, you could see the sort of horror that had been inflicted on him both psychologically and physically. And I'll say, too, that he told us stories that day of some of the grotesque forms of torture that are so personal and so demeaning that I've never repeated them to anyone because it's like they're just so horrific and demeaning that it feels like it's not my place to tell and repeat some of those stories. Right. It's interesting um, that a lot of people that have been tortured have the same response to their torture is that they can't speak about it. Torture has a way of eliminating people's voices. And that, of course, is one of the points of the whole strategy 
of torture is that you eliminate people's voices and it gets replaced by the voice of the regime. And so a lot of what they did was electricity and other things that were not meant to leave permanent marks on a person's body so that the whole thing remains invisible. You just disappear people off the streets. They vanish into the system of the secret police. They're tortured in ways that can't be shown or proven and then released again. And the whole system is meant to take people's voices away and to eliminate these kind of intermediary bodies between the individual and the state. The individual is entirely at the mercy of the state. And in that sense, it's part of the whole kind of strategy of neoliberalism as well. There's nothing left but individuals. I asked Bill to comment on the role of the Catholic Church with regard to the policy of torture in Chile. He tells in the book how the Church initially responded too slowly to the despotic policies of the Pinochet regime. Yeah, I think Catholic bishops tend to be conservative by nature. You know, they're the kind of gatekeepers. And, and, you know, not just Catholic bishops, but bishops in other denominations as well. They tend to be the gatekeepers, the bureaucrats and pastors trying to keep the sheep from going astray and so on. And so in Chile, you had this basic sort of idea, even among the progressive bishops, that the church is the soul of society and the state is the body. And so we don't get directly involved in politics, but we, you know, urge people to play nice. And that's the the role of the church. And I think it, it took a few years But once the military regime took over and began to torture and disappear people, the church kind of woke up and said, this is not adequate because the state doesn't just want the body, the state wants the soul as well. And so we need to kind of respond in some ways by being a body, right? By being a space where people can gather. And so the reason the book is called Torture and Eucharist is that torture is this process of atomizing and individualizing the body politic. And Eucharist is a way of kind of bringing bodies back together, social bodies back together, giving people a way of gathering in Christ's name and resisting this process of individualization. And that eventually does happen in several different ways that I describe the church kind of becomes the one place where people can gather and it begins sponsoring soup kitchens and workshops for unemployed people and places for the relatives of the disappeared to gather and human rights work. I worked on a cooperative house building project, which was affiliated with the church and so on. And so it becomes this kind of intermediate body between the individual and the state and a way to gather. And there are other ways, a a group of bishops excommunicated torturers, which then becomes this kind of very uh, public sign of what the Eucharist actually means in a situation where some Christians are torturing other Christians. And it also sponsored um, uh, these kind of flash mobs, the Sebastian Acevedo movement against torture, where people would on a kind of prearranged signal, all gather in front of a place where someone was being tortured, hand out leaflets, you know, begin chanting, that sort of thing. At great personal sacrifice, of course, they would then be hauled away to prison. But this was one way of kind of, they talked about communicating the word komulgar, uh, meaning kind of eucharistically communicating with the people that are being tortured in prison by receiving blows on their own bodies in these kinds of flash mob street protests. So the story ultimately becomes a fairly good one where the church becomes this kind of resistance to the military regime, which eventually leads to a transition to democracy. Mm. I I was also uh, struck by you mentioning the Chicago Boys. I, I, did, I did have a friend loan me a book right before going down there that started talking about the Chicago Boys. But prior to that point, I, I was unfamiliar with them. And I was speaking one day to a Chilean professor at the school where we were teaching classes. And he asked me something about my knowledge of the Chicago Boys. And I admitted that only very recently had I ever learned of them. I said, so is that widely known here? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody here knows about the Chicago Boys. 
So as a bit of background here, Milton Friedman was a Nobel Prize winning economist famed for his embrace of so-called free market mechanisms. The so-called Chicago Boys were a number of Friedman's devotees who helped set up free market mechanisms in Chile after the dictator Pinochet overthrew the democratically elected socialist Salvador Allende. To be fair, Friedman did make numerous public statements which critiqued the despotic policies of Pinochet. And again, it was just his humbling sort of reality of here's this whole country that knows this story of the ways in which the United States and this representative of neoliberalism inflicted or at least contributed to the infliction of great pain upon this populace and of which I was relatively ignorant until that point. Right. Friedman actually made comments in a press conference when he was in Chile. He said the economy needed shock treatment. Uh, And this was at a time when electricity was being used to torture tens of thousands of people. He, of course, did not have that in mind, but people know that story and see the parallels in ways that were just oblivious to it. There was a billboard in the neighborhood that I lived in that read, La Libre Empresa Crea, Crea en la Libre Empresa, which means free enterprise creates, believe in free enterprise. And that was part of the ideology of the the military regime. Happiness is going to come eventually. The wealth will trickle down if you just let the free market do its magic. And of course, it is magic. And it's something that needs to be believed in because the evidence of it was never present and still isn't. I'll stick in a parenthetical here for those who might be unfamiliar with your book, Being Consumed. You don't generally tend to make an argument for socialism as such, while you're also doing a critique of capitalism. But at least as I read Being Consumed, you're making an argument that the arguments around so-called free market economies have failed to take account of the realities of power. And that if we don't take account of the realities of power, then both a socialist state or so-called free market economy both can become mechanisms of immense uh, oppression. Is that is that a fair enough kind of summary? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of what I write is very critical of the state. So I'm not a kind of advocate of increased state power generally, but I'm also not an advocate of the so-called free market as such, because I don't believe that there is such a thing as the free market. You know, it's usually defined as a market in which the state does not intervene But that does not guarantee that it's free. It might be free in the negative sense that nobody is interfering with people getting what they want, but that ignores the huge disparities of power, right? So if a corporation is paying, you know, young Thai girls 30 cents an hour to work in their factories, technically it's free if the transaction is not coerced by the state. But in a very real sense, it's not freedom at all. It's close to slavery. The person who takes a job like that takes it because they have no choice, because they're desperate, and because of these kind of tremendous disparities of power that exist in the world. So the real question is not, you know, whether we should affirm or damn the free market as such, but when is a market free? And I think it's only free when you can actually point to the flourishing of all of the parties involved. And so you have to have a much richer concept of freedom where you define it not just negatively, but positively as something that leads to the flourishing of all of the people involved and and the earth included, all of the parties involved. And for that, you need some kind of theological discernment about what are the true goods of the human person. It can't just be this kind of excuse where you say that a market is free as long as there's no government interference. One of the great Christian idolatries, I think, is nationalism. You could see it certainly in Chile. There are all these kind of patria y libertad kind of movements, fatherland and liberty. 
kind of right wing uh, movements that claim to be Christian. And I think it's really one of the most salient kinds of idolatries that Christians have been uh, involved in in the United States as well, this kind of Christian nationalism, which treats the United States as a kind of privileged actor and providential actor in God's dispensation. And there's just no scriptural basis for it. The chosen people in the Bible is the people of Israel and the church, and it's meant to be something international that transgresses these artificial boundaries that have been set up among nation states. This idea of America first and so on is really a Christian heresy and a a really distinct um, form of idolatry that we need to resist and, and need to talk a lot more about. It's something that kind of goes under the radar. People just kind of assume. And part of the reason, of course, is that nationalism is parasitic on certain kinds of Christian virtues. It's a loyalty to something larger than oneself. It's a willingness to sacrifice on behalf of one's neighbor and so on. And these are real virtues. But it usually translates into this kind of exclusion of others and a certain sort of willingness to not just sacrifice oneself for others, but to kill for the country, for the nation state, that I think is deeply problematic. This has been our interview with Bill Cavanaugh, professor at DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois. Check out the episode notes on our website to get links to the article we discussed on Roe v. Wade, as well as get links to Bill's books, all highly recommended. Please remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and refer us to a fellow podcast listener. Got feedback? We would love to hear from you. Email us, text, attach a voice memo, or send to the address podcast at tokenshow.com. Our thanks to all the Stellar team that make this podcast possible. Executive producer and manager Christy Bragg of Bragg Management. Co-producer Jacob Lewis of Great Feeling Studios. Associate producers Ashley Bain, Leslie Thompson, and Tom Anderson. Production assistant Kara Fox. And music beds by Zach and Maggie White and Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening and peace be unto thee. The Tokens Podcast is a production of Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studios. Oh. <laughs>